In May of 1840, the polymath Thomas Carlyle, Scottish author, mathematician, and philosopher to name a few, delivered a series of lectures on the subject of heroes and heroic figures throughout history. These lectures were preserved and published as a book in the next year in 1841 titled On Heroes, Hero Worship, and the Heroic in History. Within the book, there are six lectures that Carlyle gave, each fascinating and worth discussing in their own right. Today we are going to be examining Carlyle's fifth lecture, The Hero is a Man of Letters, to illustrate how a literary man, the author, the poet, and the political philosopher, can not only shape the world around him, but how his ideas can be rallied behind to lead a nation into change, both for better or for worse. In this lecture, he highlights three men, Samuel Johnson, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and Robert Burns. Today we will examine Carlyle's definition of a heroic man of letters, his views on these three men, before finally looking towards our recent history to see who might meet that definition of a heroic man of letters today. Carlyle begins these lectures by stating that unlike heroic men of priests or prophets, such a literary man will be around for some considerable length of time, as the art of printing, writing, and ready writing will last long after the 19th century. Much like that of his previous lectures on the priest, prophet, or divine, Carlyle begins to explain what heroism looks like for a man who takes on such an undertaking of writings to change not only the world around him, but to have a providential sense of inspiration, to rise to the occasion as one does to be a heroic figure. Here, Carlyle says the following, There are genuine men of letters, and not genuine, as in every kind there is a genuine and a spurious. If hero be taken to mean genuine, then I say the hero as man of letters will be found discharging a function for us which is ever honorable, ever the highest, and was once well known to be the highest. He is uttering forth, in such a way he has the inspired soul of him, all that a man in any case can do. I say inspired, for we call originality, sincerity, genius, the heroic quality which we have no good name for signifies that. The hero is he who lives in the inward sphere of things, in the true, divine, and eternal, which exists always, unseen to most, under the temporary and trivial. His being is in that. He declares that abroad by act or speech, as it may be in declaring himself abroad. His life, as we said before, is a piece of the everlasting heart of nature herself, all men's life is, but the weak many know not the fact, and are untrue to it in most times. The strong few are strong, heroic, perennial, because it cannot be hidden from them. The man of letters, like every hero, is there to proclaim in such sort as he can. Intrinsically, it is the same function, which the old generations named a man prophet, priest, divinity for doing which all manner of heroes, by speech or act, are sent into this world to do." End quote. We can see how even here, for men who write, who can look inside of themselves to see the world, are arranged a set of qualities that separate them from all the rest, putting them on the pantheon of heroes, illustrating his understanding that the world is led by great men, and has been for time immemorial. Within this passage, however, we can see Carlyle's influences, particularly that of Johann Gottlieb Fichte, the German philosopher known for his views on synthesis and German idealism. Signing Fichte, he continues, Fichte calls the man of letters, therefore, a prophet, or as he prefers to phrase it, a priest, continually unfolding the godlike to men. Men of letters are perpetual priesthood, from age to age, teaching all men that a god is still present in their life, and that all appearance, whatsoever we see in the world, is but as a vesture for the divine idea of the world, for that which lies at the bottom of appearance. In the true literary man there is thus ever, acknowledged or not by the world, a sacredness. He is the light of the world, the world's priest." End quote. Carlyle is quick to note, however, that these priests are men of their own, independently within their own thoughts and means. Carlyle laments the idea of a subsidized literary class, and would only make these men less genuine in their ideas. 
He writes, quote, One remark I must not omit, that royal or parliamentary grants of money are by no means the chief thing wanted. To give our men of letters stipends, endowments, and furtherance of cash will do little towards the business. On the whole, one is weary of hearing about the omnipotence of money. I will rather say that, for a genuine man, it is no evil to be poor, that there ought to be literary men poor, to show whether they are genuine or not." End quote. And these priests, both as men who have experienced poverty or have come from some means, embody the heroic from one of the most important inventions of mankind, that of writing. Writing, which Carlyle describes as a miraculous invention, as a way to preserve the tales of great men, and whose stories have changed our worldviews, recorded great feats, and have even started religions, ranging from Agamemnon to Moses. But from Carlyle's influences, we can see how he defines the heroic within his lecture, Johnson and Burns as literary men, heroic men, and offers a word of warning to heroic men whose writings are well remembered, like that of Rousseau. Carlyle discusses both Samuel Johnson and Robert Burns as true men of letters, arguing that they revealed traditions and truths that were unsullied by modern times, that truths were spoken even if it came at great personal, mental, or financial cost to these literary men. He is adamant that there is nothing more nobler than to show the truth, to strive for sincerity and originality, even if it comes at great personal cost. There is a sense of asceticism in Carlyle's appraisal in The Heroic Literary Man, along with the great personal burdens to be carried that are seemingly par for the course of being such a heroic figure. Whether that be carrying the burdens of an impoverished youth, spiritual or physical pain, or hypochondria like that of Samuel Johnson. Carlyle praises Johnson for still managing to give out great works to the world, and which not only came from a place of the soul, which one does not have to be boastful or open about, that even while in poverty, Johnson would not steal, let alone try and prove himself worthy to the world, just merely a man offering his perspective in art and observations. Carlyle laments that Johnson's works have fallen out of favor with the younger generation, something that we see even today with transformative literary works, even with Carlyle himself. But that style and ways of thinking should be hopefully around long after Carlyle's time in the 19th century. Sincerity and originality, the continuing themes of what makes a man of letters a member of the heroic, is continued when Carlyle begins to speak of the poet and bard Robert Burns, to a point that sincerity is Burns's chief quality according to Carlyle in his lecture. Of course, with Burns being well known for the themes and language that he used in everyday life and various occupations, a byproduct of his impoverished upbringing that he had undergone. Whether it was him being the oldest of seven children, his father unable to find stable work, and he himself, as Carlyle notes, that Burns appeared under every disadvantage, uninstructed, poor, and born only to hard manual toil. And yet, despite this, emerges as an ordinary man to speak a language of common stock, found within the small province of the country he was known in, emerging as a heroic man, a man known universally by his use of language of the people, possessing a quality of leadership to those men who read him and knew him, inspiring countless others to give their hand at using their own common tongue and vernacular to speak about the world, truth, and beauty. Leadership in its sincerity and originality is what Carlyle remarks to be vital characteristics of a heroic man of letters. This does not mean, however, that such inspirations can always be for the good, as Carlyle spends some time lamenting the impact of works of great historical importance. And for a man who wrote a three-volume historical account of the French Revolution, there is no greater name to lament as a man of letters than that of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. In fact, the first real mention of Rousseau in his lecture is describing the man, quote, Your Rousseau, driven into mad exasperation, kindling the French Revolution by his paradoxes, end quote. Carlyle, showing his contempt for how such enlightenment thinking can set the world ablaze, writes the following, quote, The French Revolution found its evangelist in Rousseau. 
his semi-delirious speculations on the miseries of civilized life, the preferability of the savage to the civilized, and such like, helped well to produce a whole delirium in France generally. True, you may well ask, what could the world, the governors of the world, do with such a man? Difficult to say what the governors of the world could do with him. What he could do with them is unhappily clear enough. Guillotine for a great many of them. End quote. From here we can see the literary man that Carlyle praises, and the dangers that come from such sincere observations. We can now turn to the present. Now, in the year of our Lord, 2021, who are our men of letters? Our heroes that we can look back towards that still inspire us to this day, regardless of their status or station, as long as truth and sincerity, the lacking need to prove themselves to the world, who can we look back on and say that these men are truly worthy of joining the pantheon of heroic men of letters as Carlyle has appraised? We will turn to three men, men whom you may not agree with in my listing, but as an effort for us to think about who we should praise, both the literary and political, to consider their impact upon history and our present times. But first, we must start with Carlyle. As so many have written and talked about on other channels, we must apply his own definition to himself, without needing to prove himself or to live within his means, as Carlyle, not fond of lectures, did so in order to make some money at the behest of his friends. But whether he spoke of the French Revolution, slavery, modern politics, the decay of political, social, and judicial institutions and pamphlets and more, he certainly meets his own definition to be a heroic man of letters. Even now, from historical societies, content creators, and even more aloof writers like Moldbug praise Carlyle for his honesty and his appraisals of the current state of decline and modernity. But who else? Of the last 200 years, from our modern times and the days online to the times of great publishing houses, who do we look to as our own man of letters? And who do we look to as men whose writings would wreak unspeakable horrors upon the world? Today, I offer the following two men for consideration. One is a man of letters, and another whose writings we should share the same scorn upon as Carlyle did for Rousseau. To praise our men of letters, our heroic, I would submit that of Peter Edwin Garrett, also known as Garrett Garrett, author, writer, and editor in the United States both before and after the Great Depression and the New Deal. Before Burnham would tell us about the managerial revolution, Garrett would lament the revolution that transformed American society in 1938 in his monograph, The Revolution Was. It is here where his words were said with the most profound sincerity and condemnation to the American right, as they are laid out right at the beginning of the passage, where he writes the following, quote, There are those who still think they are holding the pass against a revolution that may be coming up the road but they are gazing in the wrong direction. The revolution is behind them. It went by in the night of depression, singing songs to freedom. Whether it is the criticism of the rise of the American empire, numerous writings praising the entrepreneurial spirit of his nation's people, Garrett, in his sincerity and honest awareness of the situation, writing the revolution was well into his older years, gives us the perspective of a man who lived and saw his nation go through great changes, and is still referenced as a foundational thinker among American libertarians and the right, even to this day. Garrett must be seen as one of our heroic men of letters, recognizing that things have changed, while other men still wait in preparation for such changes to come, even though they have occurred right under their noses. But while we list someone as a member of the heroic, we must now turn to the men whose works have changed the world, but not necessarily for the better. Just as Carlyle laments and despises Rousseau for help bringing about the French Revolution, if Carlyle were alive today, he would still be articulating on the woes brought on by that Frenchman, as Rousseau was an important and influential thinker to one of the most consequential writers and thinkers of contemporary politics, Karl Marx. I need not detail such an influence Marx has had upon the world, despite coming from relative means and spending lavishly in his youth, much to his father's lament. His materialist philosophy has been the inspiration for revolutions, mass executions, and the influence of men who topple states and bring the world into a newfound paradigm, 
both within the realms of great powers and economic thought. But surely there is enough for us to leave such analysis there, and that both of these men have a legacy of work that still leave a major impact upon us today. Carlyle's lectures on the hero give us a greater understanding of the great men who have shaped history and the world, whether they be priests, divinities, or in this case men who simply saw the world and put pen to paper. These men of letters, the literary man, will exist long after our time, whether through blogs, substacks, self-published novels, each man has the capacity for great sincerity and originality, but so few can reach a monumental presence of the heroic. And even now, in our time in this century, who might be the men of letters that future Carlyle's praise or scorn? Bronze Age pervert? Nick Land? Thomas Piketty? We may not know what the future holds, but for our heroic men of letters, thanks to Thomas Carlyle, we do certainly know what to look for. Thank you all for watching. I hope that you've been having a great Carlisle day so far, and I'll see you all in the next video. Be prudent, everyone.